In this video, I'm just going over what is social welfare. And a simple definition would be that social welfare is the collective utility for a group of people. And a group can be any, any group of people. It can be a family, it can be a bowling league, it can be the citizens of a town, it can be the citizens of a country. Um, so you might imagine who decides um, or who would be maximizing something in a social welfare function. Government is the classic group to maximize something, but it could be um, the parents in a family making decisions for their whole family. It could be the leaders in a civic organization. Really anyone who's making decisions for a collective group of people that they care about that's going to be um, someone making a decision by maximizing what they perceive to be social welfare. So the group is defined in various ways. So of course when we're talking about the town, the state, and the country, we're talking about all of the citizens in those places. So there are different types of social welfare functions that we might want to use and I'm going to identify three classic structures for organizing social welfare functions. So let's do that. The first way of maximizing a social welfare function or of constructing one that you might want to maximize would be to just list the values that you're trying to optimize and give every one of them an importance weight. And of course, if you're optimizing a, a social welfare function, that means you're choosing something that the leader of this group has to choose. So it's going to look something like this. So here we have a situation where perhaps the government is deciding um, on two different choices and this might be the tax rate or the rate of redistribution of money through the tax system. Um, you might have other choice variables like um, a cap on the total amount of pollution that's allowed where you're going to distribute that pollution through some sort of cap and trade system. I mean, really, it's any decision that the government might make that, that becomes your choice variable. And of course, you're just going to choose um, a particular set of choice variables because you can't look at every possible decision the government makes at once. And that's what modeling does. Modeling says, OK, um, let's simplify things by looking in depth at a couple of different choices that are maybe interrelated and um, seeing how they change social welfare. So um, this social welfare function, we have three values for the population that we're trying to maximize. There's economic well-being, there's equality of the population, and maybe that would be measured as a Gini coefficient or something like that. And then we have freedom, and you'd have to have some conceptual uh, way of thinking about what is an increase and decrease in freedom as it responds to us changing our choice variables. And each of these values is a function of the choices you're making as the government. And of course, there's an importance weight placed on each of these. So you might imagine some of the disagreements that happen between leaders and a government are going to be over how important each of these three factors is going to be. Some people place a really heavy importance on freedom and a lower importance on equality. So for some people, that's the reverse. For some people, it's, it's about equal for all of these three. Um, but... Setting up a social welfare function can help you th structure your thinking as you try to make decisions within the context of the government. So that's the first way that you can set up a social welfare function is by maximizing some set of values that matter to the population. Now the second way that you can construct a social welfare function is to just add up the utility of everybody involved. And what does this look like in practice? Let's look. Okay, so here is the utility of all 37 people in an organization. Maybe this is a civic, civic organization like the Lions Club. And the leaders of the organization are trying to think through what does each person value and how, what might it look like if we added up everybody's utility. Um, now, of course, and of course they're making some kind of decision for the organization. Maybe that's the frequency of meetings or 
maybe that's um, the due, the fees they're collecting in dues to the civic organization and what they're going to do with those fees, have parties or host um, local s Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts clubs, whatever your decision is, that's going to be your choice variable or variables and you think through every person's utility according to that, all the way up through the 37 people involved. Now, there's so far I've placed an equal weight on everybody's utility, and that's going to be the case if you're um, thinking about things from a utilitarian perspective, you just weight everybody's utility equally and add it up. But you could have different weights on these. You could, for example, place a heavier weight on people who are worse off. So maybe you want, you care more about the members of the organization that um, are low income and you want to place a heavier importance weight on those people. Or you could even place all of the importance weight on the person who's the worst off in the situation, and that would be a Rawlsian social welfare function, which I'll talk about elsewhere. But basically, the second way of constructing a social welfare function is simply to add up everybody's utility. Now, our third way of constructing a social welfare function is actually somewhat similar to the second. It could almost be considered a subcategory of the second, but I'm going to have it be different, and that's to do a stakeholder analysis. So what this is going to look like is you have different categories of people who are affected differently and you add up the utility of each of these separate groups of people um, differently in your function. So let me show you what this looks like. Okay, so we have a situation where we have four different types of stakeholders, the teachers, the parents, the kids, and the non-parent citizens. This sort of captures everyone who might be affected by a decision like how much to fund schools or how many uh, new uh, baseball fields to build for uh, elementary and high school students in the area. There's lots of different, perhaps, school board decisions, and they're going to be thinking about um, what are the different relevant stakeholders who are each affected differently by the decision and how might I construct a utility function for that group? Now, you could weight these differently depending on the share of the population that belongs to each group or of course you can weight them however you want. So if you want to put a heavier weight on kids, because of course kids are the future and they're going to determine the future of the health of your city, um, you can do that, you can put heavier weight on kids, but I'll just do it for now in a classic way, which might be what percentage of the population belongs to each group. Okay, so here we have the percentage of the population belonging to each group. We've got 5% teachers, 50% parents, 15% children, and 30% non-parent citizens of the county or of the school district. And of course, these all add up to 100, so we're weighing everybody's utility equally, um, which is one option. So I basically just laid out three different ways of setting up a social welfare function that can be used when you're analyzing how to make decisions for groups.